You know, you got you got nice color skin. What color would you say that is? My color. <laughs> Hey film friends, I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Welcome to the channel. You know, with so many movies dropping right on streamers nowadays, Furman on Film is advocating that you go see this one in the theater. Seriously, take out a second mortgage, sell your car, donate a kidney, do whatever it takes to get enough money together for the price of tickets, popcorn, and a soda. What? It's expensive. This is Killers of the Flower Moon. Based on David Grant's widely praised best-selling book, Killers of the Flower Moon is set in 1920s Oklahoma and depicts the serial murder of members of the oil-wealthy Osage Nation, a string of brutal crimes that came to be known as the Reign of Terror. If I had to sum this whole experience up in just a sentence or two, I'd say this is the least like early Marty in so many ways, yet fits right into the center of late period Scorsese's wheelhouse. He sets us up for this too. The film opens with a couple of slamming tracks, rhythmic drums, and a prominent electric guitar. He gives us the opening virtuosic tracking shot of Leo getting off the train and entering the town. But not 20 minutes into the picture, all of that is gone. There are no smash cuts and whip pans, freeze frames and split screens. He's not needle dropping classic rock bangers or using colorful degenerates to romanticize mob violence as a barrel of laughs. This isn't Goodfellas or Casino. It's not even Mean Streets. No, Killers of the Flower Moon belongs firmly with the late period ruminations of silence and the Irishman. Pictures which still deal with Marty's classic themes, the depravity of humanity, versus the pull of religious faith. The violence of gangsters juxtaposed with questions of whether evil can ever be redeemed. And as Scorsese has openly talked about wrestling with these in his own late life, he now spreads out this grand story and very slowly and methodically presents his tale. See, Killers of the Flower Moon isn't about solving the mystery, and it's not about glamorizing criminals. Most of these guys are utter buffoons. It's about showing the machinations of white evil at the time. The insidious presence of would-be benefactors with their own repugnant schemes to rob and pillage indigenous peoples. When I think about what I liked about this picture, one of the first things that comes to mind is the production and costume design. These are so unreal that they instantly transport us to this specific place and time. There are also small moments of editing which carry extreme weight and power. Jack Fisk, Jacqueline West, Thelma Schoonmaker. We should be learning these names as much as Leo and Bob and Lily in a Scorsese picture. The way certain shots are framed, how decidedly un-Marty-like some sequences are here. Where the camera moves very little at all and just lets us drink in a conversation between a future husband and wife at a dinner table, for instance. But sure, yeah, at the end of the day, the performances are probably what's going to most recommend killers to us all. Leo is as sturdy as an oak in a Scorsese picture, and honestly, I think his performance may actually be the third best one here. And as for De Niro, I would put this in the pantheon of one of his great roles. He is the personification of evil with this soft-spoken, velvety, and demure voice. A real philanthropist on the cover of things, but a scheming, conniving wolf in sheep's clothing underneath. And Lily Gladstone, has anyone done more with less in a performance? It's all about the eyes here, stolid glances. She's a picture of strength and composure, even as the world around her is crumbling and sickness has come for her like so many of her kin. She's the heartbeat of the picture and becomes more arresting with each new scene. And as for critiques, let me just start off by saying that this is not a whodunit procedural investigation like what lies at the center of the book. Instead, the writers opted to foreground Ernest and Molly's love story, and the reveal of the killers, as I said, is not really the point at all. They also sidelined almost all of the FBI stuff until the third act. The point is that how you feel about all of these changes is going to go a long way to your final verdict on Killers of the Flower Moon. This is a film which is epically long, but also moves from a simple love story to a larger tale 
of an Osage nation under siege, to a third act about lawmen and courtrooms and miscarriages of justice. Now, to some, all of these transitions could be really jarring. Choosing to not make this all a murder mystery allows us to explore the thematic weight of all of these people who suffered and the many crimes that went unsolved. I will say that the film isn't perfect. I was a bit confused about Molly's motivations in the third act and her treatment of Ernest. And I'm pretty sure Brendan Fraser and some other lawyers are just in a completely different flick than all the rest of the cast. So, what do we conclude? Martin Scorsese is 80 years old and still churning out masterpieces of the highest caliber. Here's a story with criminals and killings like the mob flicks of his early years, but without the romance and the humor. No, this is a heavy and pensive examination of the sins of America's past. The evil of greedy people, the idiocy of their minions, and an Osage nation that deserves to be remembered. Well, there you have it. The only thing left to discuss is our rating for this picture. FOF gives Killers of the Flower Moon 4.3 out of 5 stars. If you enjoyed this review, please let us know by giving us a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. Also, don't forget to check out FermanOnFilm.com for even more movie content. Thanks for watching. I'm Nick Furman. This is Furman on Film. Stay firm, my friends. Mm.